welcome to episode 32 of Once Upon a Nightmare. I am your host Lorraine and I'm here to discuss the horrors of the world, be it fiction or real. This week we are going very much real as I discuss a serial killer known as the Trash Bag Killer, the Freeway Killer, and that is Patrick Wayne Kearney. Can I just say with this episode before I get into it, there was a lot of conflicting information and I think I've got what is right, but if you know any different, feel free to let me know. You may have heard the term the freeway killer before in relation to other serial killers who also targeted men in the 17s. You've got William Bonin and Randy Kraft. Bonin would go on to be executed, but Kraft got his death sentence changed to life in prison and now resides in San Quentin. And while I had heard and unfortunately knew about Bonin and a bit about Kraft, I'd never really heard much about Patrick Kearney. But Patrick's days would soon be numbered when former deputy D.A. Dan Baklowski was given an assignment in 1975. There were bags of rubbish being found that contained body parts. Identifying these was difficult, if not impossible, as in some cases the head was in fact missing. Due to how clean in which the victims were decapitated, it was concluded by the pathologist that the person had done this many times before. And after this gruesome discovery, it would soon become clear that the police were dealing with a serial killer. But the scale was something that they never imagined. Patrick Kearney's reign of terror began in 1962 and ended with his arrest in July of 1977. The case officially began on April 13th, 1975. And over 15 years, Kearney would kill about 38 men, if not more. He would be sentenced to life in prison on December 21st, 1977. Kearney is actually still alive and serving life in Merle Creek State Prison in California. Patrick Wayne Kearney would plead guilty to 21 murders. He was asked by the judge why he did it and his response, I prefer not to. Dan Baklowski said this wasn't out of embarrassment or shame for what he had done. It was more of just because there is nothing behind his response and as we get more and more into the case, we will see there is nothing behind Kearney but murder. Patrick Wayne Kearney was born in East LA, California on the 24th of September, 1939. He was the oldest of three sons. His younger brothers were Michael and Chester. His mother Eunice was Karen, but his father George, not so much. George was an LA policeman, but left that to become a salesman with a travel agency. And he didn't have much interest in his family, the only real interest he took in Patrick was to teach him how to shoot. And this would, of course, play a part in how he murdered some, most of his victims. His father taught him how to shoot pigs and Patrick enjoyed this act. He would later go on to slaughter animals for fun and he did enjoy what was inside them. His curiosity as to what was in the animals didn't simply stop at just looking. He would, in fact, roll about in their insides and he got major satisfaction out of doing this. His relationship with his father was very complicated. His father was very much the stereotypical strong American man, a man's man. Patrick just wasn't. So while it would appear that the home had issues, you know, with regards to his father, there's nothing I could see that would suggest that he'd had, he had any issues with his mother or his siblings. Patrick was a very small and somewhat strange kid. And as a result, he was the perfect target for bullies at school. These acts against him made him begin to like fantasize about killing the ones who had wronged him. He wanted to exact revenge. At only eight years old, he remembers fantasizing about killing them at only eight. And that's quite terrifying to think that someone so young can have those thoughts and feel that way. It would appear the bullies gave him the motive and his father gave him the tools unknowingly on how to kill. When people look back on Patrick, it would make sense as it was becoming clear to some that Patrick, you know, he was acting very differently and he began to withdraw from everyone. But I guess you couldn't predict what turn Patrick's life would actually take. No one could have truly known. This kind of withdrawal, it's, it isn't surprising as he was bullied from a very young age and a move of the whole family to Reseda, California really took the bullying that Patrick would experience to a new level. At 14, he would move again to another school and again he was bullied. Again, the family moved to Wilcox, Arizona and again the bullying started. They then moved again to Redonda Beach in California where Patrick would go to high school and after he graduated, they would move again to Houston, Texas. 
All the kids he met were extremely brutal. And to be honest, this kid didn't stand a chance wherever he went. Not that that's an excuse, but it's really bad that no matter where he went, he was bullied. Patrick did also have an extremely high IQ of 180. That's very high. And while he was being abused, he would take himself off and spend more time on his education. He did have a flair for languages and he managed to speak almost fluently Spanish, Japanese and Chinese. After he graduated school, he then went to study engineering at El Camino College in Torrance, California. The family also moved around a little bit more and Kearney would end up in Texas, where he would in fact marry, but this wasn't to last and he was quickly divorced. He would go on then to join the Air Force as an engineer by the time he reached 20. Even as an adult, Kearney, he wasn't the biggest man standing at around five foot five, a very slight build, and there was nothing really about him that stood out. In 1960, he would fall in love with a man, David Hill, a high school dropout from Lubbock, Texas. David Hill was in fact married to a female, but he fell for Patrick. Kearney was discharged from the military and David would soon leave his wife and the two of them would eventually move in with each other in California in 1961. They would go on to have a very on and off again relationship and this lasted around 15 years. After being together for about a year, David would in fact leave Patrick and this was one of the many times he did and he would then hitchhike traveling around the States and eventually would make his way back to his wife. This is when Patrick's life took a drastic change and a change that would affect the lives of many young men and their families and friends. Patrick did not take David leaving him very well at all. He could not take rejection. So the murders began. His main weapon to kill was a gun. He did smother some of his younger victims, but the gun was used most of the time. We've seen how he was taught to shoot at a young age and how this impacted his life, but due to size, overempowering a larger, heavier set man, that could be quite hard because he was so small. The gun showed him he could take down anything. Having started on animals, it showed him what he was capable of, what power he had over an animal and then over a person. His size would not matter when killing as he had the power with the gun. And of course, he would kill by shooting and usually behind the ear. So the victim... They may not even have known what was happened when he did use this particular method. When he, of course, goes for the children, again, this could be maybe a power play. These children are a lot smaller than him and therefore they would be a lot easier to overpower. He didn't need the gun. So it's interesting to see how he changed his MO for some of his younger victims, you know, that would be smaller than him. He would claim his first victim, who was unnamed. The young man was only 19. Kearney would give him a lift, and this was another thing he did quite often. He shot the young man behind the ear, the technique that was used when killing the pigs with his father as a young boy. After killing him, he would then have sex with the corpse and mutilate it. His next victim was the first victim's young cousin. And again, this man isn't known. He was only 16, and again, he was shot and sexually assaulted. Apparently, the cousin had seen his cousin, getting into Kearney's car, so he decided to kill him to take out a witness. Another man known as Mike, who was 18, was also treated in the same way as the first two. After the death of Mike, David Hill did return back to Kearney. Hill came back and Kearney took a little step back from the murders, so we think. In 1962, he managed to get a very well-paid job as an engineer at Hughes Aircraft. The relationship between the two men, again, was pretty much what you'd call normal for a few years, but the killings would eventually start up again. Kearney would meet a young man called Tony Stewart, he, who he did previously know. This guy had actually mowed his lawn, so they kind of knew each other. Kearney took him back to the apartment where he then took out a stethoscope and kind of told the boy, I've got medical experience and wanted to check his heartbeat. Tony was only 19 and Kearney had bought him some beers, but Kearney was like insisted that they went back to his house to drink them in kind of like an adult being responsible looking after this young boy who couldn't drink as in America you have to be 21 to drink you know if he wants to drink fine but you need to be looked after at the start Tony did feel okay about what was going on with his heart being checked but then things just did get a little bit weird but luckily for Tony David came back and then Tony said he needed to go home Kearney would drive him home and Tony would in fact be one of the lucky ones to get away because he was not murdered and he did go on to write a book about the whole experience. 
Both Hill and Kearney travelled to Tijuana, Mexico in 1967, and while there, they were lucky enough to bump into an old friend of Hill's. George, he was kind enough to offer them some, lo some lodgings. And Kearney's ugly ways would rear its head, and he would murder George. George would have never known what hit him, as he was asleep at the time, and Kearney would shoot him in the head. And the strange thing about this, if it could get any stranger, is that not only would Kearney like murder him in the home, but everything that was done to him was done while Hill was there. He was in the house. So after George was murdered, he would come to the same fate as the other men. He took him into the bathroom, had sex with the corpse, skinned him, took a bullet from his head and then buried him in his own back garden and then behind the garage also. This would ramp up the murders. The two men then moved to Redondo Beach where Kearney brought a house and again, settled into everyday life, but the two would continue to argue. And when this happened, Kearney would take off, go for a drive and pick up young men. Hill didn't work and this probably caused some issues with regards to finances. And it kind of shows that when Kearney's happy, apparently, apparently, we say he didn't murder. But when things weren't going as well, his way, this is when he would go out and do it. So either he took breaks or he simply didn't admit when he was talking to the police. Hill would leave Kearney again, but he didn't have a conversation with him this time. He simply left a note. And of course, Kearney had only one way of dealing with this rejection, and that was to go off and murder. As Kearney picked up his unsuspecting victims, he would kill most of them quite quickly. This way, he wouldn't have to try and control the person, and he could simply just drive to a secluded area rape them, either bring them home, he would dismember the bodies, you know, some he would drain the blood and, you know, once he'd finished with the ones he brought back, he would simply put them in bin bags and just dump them in various areas and other victims would simply be dumped without being dismembered, bodies were just left. As we get into the victims, it is a bit unclear as to when some of them died. Some of them have barely been mentioned and there isn't a lot of information on them. So after George, his next victim was a young boy of only 13, John Demichik. He was picked up by Kearney on the side of the road and it would appear with John that he wouldn't die straight away. He had been shot, but Kearney took him to a secluded area where he was in fact raped and left to die. His next victim was only 17, James Barrick. He too was hitchhiking. He was shot in the head and left to die. And just when you think it can't get any worse... Kearney takes on a whole new level as he murders another child, but this child would only be five. This was Ronald Dean Smith Jr. He was playing outside with a friend in the park. The friend had left and, and uh, Ronald was there on his own. And the 70s was a bit of a different time. You know, kids did go out a bit more unattended. You know, I myself, you know, maybe not when I was five, but I'm a 70s kid. And I know I was out and about when I was that age. Obviously, we don't do that now. And Ronald, unfortunately, would not be found until two months later. He, in fact, went missing on August 24th, 1974. And he would be found by children who were collecting cans along Riverside County's Ortega Highway on October 12th, 1974. It soon came to light that this little boy, unfortunately, he wasn't killed instantly. And he did spend time with Kearney where Kearney spent a few days torturing him, and after two days, he did suffocate him. His next was 21-year-old Albert Rivera. He was killed in 1975, and again, it would seem he was shot in the head, taken back to Kearney's home, raped, and he was cut up into pieces and put into a bin bags again and dumped. Larry Jean Walters, he was only 21 when he would become the next victim, where he was, you know, he'd suffer the same fate as Albert. Larry, unfortunately, though, he was a very trusting pe person to other people. He had the mind of an eight to ten year old. And while he was the eldest sibling, he's old, his younger siblings did, in fact, look after him. Larry's family have spoken about how content he was just simply being around them. He trusted everyone and his sisters were so overprotective of him, like they just wanted to make sure that nobody took advantage of him. The day he went missing, Larry was meant to go over to his sister's house to collect his checks and he didn't show up, and he didn't show up to work. The day went into the next, and still no show, so Larry's mother did go to the police to fill out a missing persons report, but it would be unfortunately two years before they actually found out what happened to him, and this was simply because Kearney did confess. Larry had accepted a lift from Kearney, and he took him back to his house, shot him in the head, and killed him. 
His sister explains that when they found out, they had one question. And a question I think we all would kind of want to ask, but maybe not want the answer to because of what that could mean for us even more. Larry's mother, in fact, left the room when this question was about to be asked because she knew what it was. The police, the police knew what the question was before it was asked. Did he suffer? Unfortunately for Larry, he didn't know what was happening from the minute he was picked up to the minute he was killed. But his body was never found. Apparently, Kearney is unwilling to tell. They have no reason why. It's said maybe it's because he did more than what he's saying he did. Maybe it's just another form of control. But what is he hiding? Robert Billy Benefil was only 17 and again had the same fate as Larry and Albert. Although Robert's body was never found, so I assume they are taking the word of Kearney here. His next victim, Kenneth E. Buchanan, was only 17 and again accepted a lift. Kearney shot him in the back of the head, raped him. But he didn't quite have the same fate as the others because Buchanan would actually come to and then he was shot three more times and left on the side to die. Oliver Peter Molitor was only 13. Oliver had accepted a lift and him and Kearney started to play a game called Doctor, which led to sex. Oliver was then killed, his body cut up into several parts, placed in separate bin bags and dumped. He was found in several locations in Palisford's landfill. Next, we have Larry Armandaras. He was only 15 and again, no body has been found. He too was picked up by Kearney, shot in the head. Larry was taken back to Kearney's home. He was sexually abused. The victim again was dismembered, blood drained, wrapped up and simply disposed of. Next, we have Michael Craig McGee. He was 13. Again, no body was found and he was shot, raped and various put in various bin bags and disposed of. Mark Andrew Arick 20 was picked up while hitchhiking and again shot on the head, left on the side of the road and he was discovered on the same day that he was actually murdered. He was simply just thrown aside and he was found. Timothy Ingham was 19 and shot in the back of the head while he slept. His remains were thrown into a ravine and Kearney gave away his items. This boy had stuff with him and instead of just dumping them, he gave them away as presents to friends in Mexico. And funny enough, in one of the books I used, which was The Freeway Killer, I couldn't, I even searched the word because I have it online. I couldn't find anything about Timothy. William Lawrence Faherty was only 30. Randall Randy Lawrence Moore, who was 26, and David Allen and John Woody Woods, 23, were all shot in the head and left to die. They were all just left on the side. The next one is another really young victim, and that is Meryl Hondel Chance, who is eight. He's the second, second youngest victim. This little boy was playing. He was at Hughes Aircraft and he was riding his bike and an issue, there was an issue with his bike and Kearney came out to help him. He went so far as to take the boy to a bike shop to fix his bike. He then even took him for a milkshake and a burger. But he said that the reason he actually he off, also offered to bring him to Disneyland. But this, this is a very strange one because he said the reason he killed him was because he felt he had said too much in front of him. And so he suffocated him. Larry Epsi was 17. He was hitchhiking and shot in the back of the head. Then again, there was sex with the body. And he again was cut up, put into various bin bags and disposed of. Arturo Ramos Marquez, 24, was shot, killed and dismembered. Nicholas Nicky Hernandez Jimenez was 28, shot, dismembered and put in bin bags. And the man who put an end to it all was a John LeMay. He was missing for four days and was found in bin bags. They identified him through a birthmark and his murder is what would eventually reveal who, who the trash bag killer was. As they were able to identify John, and of course his family were concerned that he went missing, they were able to backtrack on his steps, where he went and who he was with. His sister Teresa was only nine when he vanished, and she remembers it quite quite clearly. They had not returned home from school and he was reported missing instantly. While Kearney's MO was mainly to shoot in the head, it couldn't be concluded how John actually died. And this was because while they did find the bags of his body, his head, his hands and his feet had all been removed. It turns out the reason for his death was over the telly. John was watching telly with Kearney and he changed the channel and Kearney didn't like this. So he shot him in the back of the head. 
After he removed the body parts he wanted, he drove to Corona with him in a rubbish bag. And according to the sister, they just simply put him in a bin in the park. Luckily, John's mother, though, Patricia, was able to give them the name of the last person that she knew that John was actually going to see. And this led them to the home of David Hill. He shared a house with Kearney in Redondo Beach. When they arrived, they were not greeted by Hill, but 37-year-old Kearney. He gave off a vibe to the police that made them believe he wasn't involved. Kearney was working as an engineer and the police felt he was this upstanding citizen and they never thought this guy could be responsible for the murders at the time. When they came, Kearney didn't make a fuss. He just simply let them in, no complaining, and acted all really cool. But the police did do a thorough search. This gave them their first clue as both white animal hair and blue carpet fi fibres that were found on two of the bin bags were in fact found in this home. They were taken to a lab and tested and it came back as a match. There was also evidence found in Hoover bags that was able to confirm Kearney was a very likely suspect or Hill or both. There was also a hacksaw blade that was found and while on first look it appeared to be really clean, they did take it apart and within all the bolts they found human hair and blood and also the bathroom was sparkly clean but they sprayed luminol on it and this showed a lot of blood too. It was in the bath and also on the walls. After this both Hill and Kearney fled their home and the police did go back to speak to them but of course they weren't there. The, the home itself had a huge amount of evidence that people were either murdered or dismembered there but the house was the only thing that connected them to the bodies. It didn't really mean necessarily that it was Kearney and or Hill. Kearney, though, it was soon found out. He did take a bit of a twisted route, if you could get any worse, with one of the victims. And that was with Arturo Marquez. The police did find another thing that linked them to it. And that was envelopes within the home. Kearney had actually taken the car keys of um, Arturo's and posted them back to his family. Arturo was found in Riverside County in March 1977, and again, Kearney needed to be in control of the situation by getting rid of these keys. He couldn't simply throw them away. He needed to know where they were going. There was soon a bulletin put out for the arrest of both Kearney and Hill on Tuesday, June 14, 1977, by Riverside County Sheriff, which had both pictures of the men on, plus all their details. They were also said to be on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. After some time on the run, they did return to California and turn themselves in. Once Kearney was in police custody, he soon began talking. Deputy DA Dan Bukowski would interview both of them and Kearney said Hill had nothing to do with it. He then dropped a big bombshell on the authorities. He didn't know how many people he had killed. He was asked, but he said 30 Admitted to 21, youngest being five, but who knows how many. And he showed no emotion when confessing. Now, of course, they have to decipher what was fact and what was fantasy. One major issue with solving crime is relying on the word of the actual killer. He or she is deciding if they simply want to give facts or they're enjoying the attention. So they might amp them up a little bit. Do they want the notoriety? As mentioned, I didn't really know who this guy was. I know big hitters and this guy has killed so many and in such a brutal fashion. I was wondering why it didn't hit my radar. Did he not want the notoriety? Did he not get it? He's not a Bundy, a Kemper, Ramirez, Burkers, Raider, the Zodiac, to name a few. You know, these guys lapped up the attention. Sure, Manson was a rock star to some people, so you can't blame the police for taking everything that he would say with a pinch of salt unless they have hard facts. And it wouldn't be the first time a killer tried to take credit for murders they didn't commit. But proof would actually eventually come their way, as Kearney told them about a murder that took place in a flat of his in 1968. He shot a man, cut him up into small pieces and put him in a box and buried him under his apartment complex. They do find the box with bones and a skull which has a 22 calibre gunshot wound to the head and hacksaw marks actually on the skull. So it's clear that he is telling some sort of truth here. After he confessed, the police did have a really strong case. And this isn't only because of his confessions and the evidence they found. Plus, you know, he knew a lot of things. But there was also a certain tape that was linked to, you know, practically all of the murders of the bin bags. And this linked Kearney. And this was a tape that was used only in one location in Southern California. And that was Hughes's aircraft. This tape was used when they wrapped the bodies in the plastic bags. And again, the plastic bags were also from where he worked. 
he did plead guilty to protect his partner, David Hill. But did David, did he know all along? Kearney has never blamed Hill for any of their crimes and he has never been done for any of them. He's always said that Hill had nothing to do with them, that he never heard a thing when George was killed. And that's really hard to believe. He was in the house when George was murdered. But then there's this indicator that maybe David didn't know. And this kind of comes down to Tony. You know, there are times when I really do find it hard to believe that he didn't know. But if he did know, then why wasn't Tony killed? If Hill had known, then Kearney wouldn't have ran out basically the house with him and spared him. Kearney didn't go to trial because he made a deal with the DA that they wouldn't seek the death penalty if they did not go after Hill. He pleaded guilty to 21 counts of murder, as I said, but it's not certain how many because he doesn't know himself how many people he actually killed. And unfortunately, families who do know that Kearney murdered their sons are still left without answers and they're still tormented as they never got to have their time in court and figure out what actually happened to their children. And this showed that Kearney was in charge right to the end. I have noticed with this case, um, not only from what I had to deal with online, but from the documentary, and Larry's sisters kind of confirmed this for me, the case focuses quite heavily on John LeMay more than the others. And that's not to say that he doesn't deserve this attention. He, of course, does. And he was the case that stopped it all. But why is there not the same inclusion for all? So while Kearney confessed to multiple murders, more than what he was charged for, there could be more, and we don't know all the names, but hopefully before he dies, maybe some more information will come to light. But as mentioned by practically everyone that dealt with him, he was so cold-hearted, he had zero remorse, and he will probably take it all to the grave. And that is my take on the Kearney murders. Like I said, this was a tough one to pick apart. And if anyone has any clearer information, I'd really love to hear, hear it. But having said that, I'm so glad that this one is actually over. I did not like doing this one at all. I regret my choice, but I did it. But for now, something a bit nicer, and that's for my podcast promo. Um, I'm going to introduce Killer Stories podcast. It's hosted by Bobby. She takes on some big cases such as BTK, Toy Box Killer. I don't know how she did the Toy Box Killer. And uh, Joe Benet Ramsey. And I'm quite new to this, but I am enjoying it. And I've got plenty more episodes to enjoy, but I'll let her tell you for herself. I'm just going to go ahead and assume you're a true crime fan. If you're like me, you can't get enough stories of murder, cold cases, and serial killers. I'm Bobby Holmes, and I'm here to scratch your true crime itch with killer stories. I think it's important to learn the history of both the victim and their attacker to try to figure out the why behind the killing. What motivated them? Was it a cheating husband who wants his wife out of the picture to start a new life? A serial killer who can't control his urges. Or maybe an unsolved case with multiple theories and suspects to discuss. From America's first serial killer in the 1800s to modern day cases and everything in between. Join me every week for a new episode of True Crime Storytelling. Subscribe to Killer Stories, available on all podcast platforms. So make sure you go check out her podcast and subscribe, rate and review. Give her some five stars. And anyway, I'd like to say thank you for listening to mine. And don't forget to rate and review on iTunes or Podchaser. I really do appreciate all the feedback. And I've had some really nice comments, which I also, of course, appreciate. But if you want more, you can find me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, on Twitter and Letterboxd as A Nightmare Pod. And you can email me on onceuponanightmarepod at gmail.com. And I'm also on Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare. And I will chat to you very soon. Thank you for listening. Bye. The Pod Breed Network is strictly for the small podcasts that are up and coming in the vast world of podcasting. Pod Breed is made up of many diverse podcasts coming together to achieve the same goal of being the best damn podcast network on the planet. Find out more at podbreed.com.